All right, week three of Advantageous. Uh, we got a lot to talk about, so let's get into this, okay? So right now, are you here? Yeah, yeah, you would say that, right? But really, are you here? Not just in the building, but mentally, are you here? Because you know there's a difference, right? You can physically be somewhere, and, but mentally be somewhere else. And some of you would be like, Bill, of course I'm not here. Do you not know what I have going on in my life, right? <laughs> the schedule that I have, the demands that I have, you have no idea what I'm, the pressure that, I, that I'm having to worry about and whatever situation that I'm in, the circumstances that I'm facing. You don't understand the, all the tons of stuff that I have to worry about to keep things running. And in your, so far, into the, like your head is so far either into the past or the future that you are not here. You might be physically here, but you're not mentally here. And that is something that happens to a lot of us. It's kind of a, an epidemic. But in light of this, I want to start with something, right? Uh, this is going to be a little different. You probably have never experienced something like this before on a Sunday. Um, I want to help you find awareness, right? Mental awareness when you're in a situation. I do this for myself, it helps me when I feel overwhelmed. And if you know me well, you go, you feel overwhelmed, right? Because I, I give off this really patient, really calm, right, joyous kind of, I rarely ever like want to dive into the bad stuff or sulk in something. Uh, sometimes it can, it's not good for my marriage not to sulk. Sometimes women like you to sulk, right? And so I've, I've learned to sulk a little bit, right? It's not just to move past something, right? Because uh, I'm a fixer. I want to fix. I want to move on. Happy, happy times, right? Like, how do I do that? Because, yes, I do get upset. Yes, I can feel overwhelmed and pressured, and I don't know what to do. Um, it doesn't happen often, but I make panic decisions that I regret uh, sometimes. But Literally, my entire life, I don't know where I learned it or when it started, but I do this, right? So we're going we're gonna to have a little exercise. Are you all ready? Some of you are scared. You're like, oh, no, what's going what's gonna to happen? I, I exercise this morning, not, lit, like, not stand-up exercise. You can stay where you are, seated. So we're going to do, uh, I, I mean, the only way, better thing to call it is a meditation, right? And some of you are like, oh, no, what's he going to have us do? Meditation has been God's thing since the beginning, and others have taken it, okay? So it's, not, it's okay to meditate because he asks us all the time to meditate on the Word of God, right? So I'm going to do something cool with you. Okay, are you all ready? Are you all scared? I hope you're a little scared. <laughs> We're going to set the mood first, okay? If you can play that, that video for me. We're going to set the mood. There you go, a little babbling brook. Isn't that nice? Nice, nice. Okay, I want y'all to do something. I want you to close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes and try to, try to relax, okay? Okay, I'm going to talk you through something. Don't answer me, but just stay silent and keep your eyes closed and stay where you're at, okay? All right, so I want you to think this. So as your eyes are closed, I want you to think about the space around you. Think about how the air is around you and how it moves around you. Try to imagine and feel every hair on your head. Be conscious of your body. Try to relax every muscle in your body. And think about it, like are you, are you squinting your eyes? Are you curling your toes? Are you clenching your jaw? Relax every muscle. Think about the chair that you're in. Think about the fabric of your chair and how it feels. Think about the cushion and how it supports you. Think about how it's held together, the chair, with bolts and, and metal and fabric and plastic. And think about how that chair is, is bolted to the ground and how it's connected to this building. And in this building, it's in the dirt and it's being pulled towards that dirt. And that dirt that it's connected to leads to more dirt and more things 
And eventually you end up with the earth, this ball that we're on. So think about how big the earth is and how you're connected to it. Think about how far the moon is. Now go a little further. How far is the sun? Think about how far that is. Now pull out from the sun and think about all the planets in our galaxy. Now keep going back and see the other galaxies and keep going back and getting bigger and think about the universe and the billions of galaxies that we have and how large it really is. Try to imagine, let that soak in of how large it is. Always expanding, always getting bigger. Now, real fast, zoom back in to your, to your galaxy, zoom back in to Earth, zoom back into this building, and now back to your chair. Down, right back down to your body and where you're at. And realize how small of a space you actually occupy, yet still significant. You exist, you were created to exist, and not just exist, but exist well. You were destined to be present in this space at this time. You are here. Now I want you to take a deep breath, bring it in, hold it, now let it out. And now I want you to repeat after me. I'm here. All right, open your eyes. How'd that feel? Are you very aware of your surroundings? Have there, is there parts of where you're sitting right now that you didn't, you ignored maybe, or you didn't realize was significant to your day and where you're at in this time? All right, you can cut the babbling book. I don't want anybody to fall asleep. Uh, stay awake now. All right, if you were falling asleep, maybe you didn't get enough sleep last night, that also is a good, uh, a good way to fall asleep. But how do you feel after that? You feel very present? Were you still thinking about all the things that was keeping you from being in this moment? Probably not. Now, depending on whatever you were thinking about before and how heavy it is, you might have picked it right back up <laughs> as soon as you opened your eyes. But for a moment there, you were here and you were nowhere else. And your mind might have left but as far as the universe is concerned, you're exactly where you're supposed to be in this moment. You were created to be here, right now. When you think about it that way, and you, and you really you know, don't take advantage of the freedom that you have to gather right now, because not all over the world, that people are allowed to do this. Not allowed to gather like we do, physically or I would say even online, if somebody's listening to this message, where they are at, they had the freedom and they were destined to be here in this moment. As disciples of Jesus, we feed on the breath of life, the, the bread of life, the, the word of God. And so right now, you are sitting in the presence of the spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Makes you very aware. Like, hold on, am I seeing everything? Am I missing something, right? You begin to get very self-aware of your situation. That the Lamb of God who was slain, that took away our sins, is right here, right now. Welcome to this holy moment. When you realize just how important it is of where you are, and what here really means. And I'm very glad that you're, you're here. Thank you for showing up. I appreciate it. And enduring, what, if that was weird for you, thank you for living through that with, with me and being able to do it. And honestly, that's what I do. If I feel overwhelmed by something, I, I bring it all back into perspective of like, what am I actually doing? And what am I facing is actually big or is it small? And it's something that, yes, it's important, but it, should it take me over? Chances are, no. But uh, we end up in this place, unfortunately, that sometimes you won't be here for long. So you might be here in the moment, in the situation, but your mind could wander. It, it could take you away from this place. You might be here physically still, but your mind is not. Sometimes it's something that I said. 
Maybe it's something that Hannah said. Maybe it's something that Jenny said. In a worship song, words, and it might trigger something in your mind, and it takes you away from here. Even though you're physically here, and you're looking at me, right? Your eyes are open. I know you're not asleep, right? I, I know that you're physically here, but you could be somewhere completely different, right? Somewhere else mentally. And it is a hard thing to grasp because it's not until we're out of a situation that we realize I wasn't really there. Even though I was physically there, I wasn't really there. And you miss something. And uh, there's something I've learned from a famous uh, philosopher, a quote uh, of his, and we all should know if you're of age, a uh, certain age. Uh, his name is Ferris Bueller, <laughs> famous philosopher. He said, life moves pretty fast, and if you don't stop and look around for a while, you might miss it. So you might be here now, but your phone could buzz and your attention is taken away, or you're thinking that your phone is, has buzzed, and it's a ghost buzz, right? And it takes your attention away. You might get an alert from Instagram, that post you made yesterday, hoping you get the likes that you wanted, right? It might pull your attention away. All, you begin to think that all you have to do today to get ready for work tomorrow, that might pull your attention away. You might be a person, you're like thinking, I'm so distracted I, 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 on where to eat after this. And all right, I'm anticipating the, the debate on where to eat after this, right? Because my stomach is grumbling. And you, so your mind goes away. You're worried about a test results that you're going to receive. You're worried about a bill that's, standing, that's sitting on your, on your countertop. You're, dis, you know, you're distracted by the person next to you because they won't stop clicking or stop, you know, whatever it may be. You, it can pull your mind away. But I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're with me, but it, you won't be here for long. This is part of the why I love what I do. I love people. It, people fascinate me, right? I can have conversations with strangers for hours uh, because I just love to hear people's stories because humans are so chaotic but so beautiful. And, and somehow in that chaos, there's beauty because it, it keeps working, because you would think, just like a computer, too much chaos, it would shut down, right? But no, humans keep going. They keep functioning, right? But I, I love to hear, hear people's stories because of that. And so there's these unusual times that I think people discount moments that they have in their life where they are there in that moment, but they don't understand the weight of what that moment is. And I'm not talking just on a physical level. I'm talking on a spiritual level. There are moments in our lives where we discount the power of what God is doing in the moment, and we don't realize just how it's meant to change our trajectory. It's meant to better us, but we discount it as something that we did or we just were a part of. There's a particular story in Scripture where I'm kind of sure this happened, because um, I feel like if it happened today, again, there would be distraction, and people wouldn't realize the power of what is happening, right? And so it's a story I mentioned last week, and it's in John 2. It's an unusual text, and it's Jesus' first miracle, right? And so just to lay the groundwork, basically, it was a party, it was a wedding, and it was an embarrassing moment for the host because the host ran out of wine, right? And so in this time, just like it would be today, um, it's, the party's over, right? So when the wine dries up, it's the same way in, in that time. And so it, the, the wine was drying up, and Jesus decided to step in, right? Um, so instead of, you know, they couldn't just send the host out for wine. There's not like total wines around at that time. Um, and so he tells, so Jesus comes in there, and he tells uh, the servants to fill up six like large vase kind of looking jars, right? It's what they keep all their, their liquids in. And he said, fill them up. And so I'm sure the servants were like, what? Okay, sure, right, whatever, whatever. What do you say, teacher? You know, kind of thing. So they fill up the jars, right? And then he tells them, I want you to ladle it out and I want you to go give it. Let the, the host of the party, the master of the party, make a taste test. I think we should keep doing that. This is a side note. I love the sound of master of parties, right? I think that's really cool. I think at weddings, they, that should be a position, you know, 
forget maid of honor, you know, groom, all that kind of stuff. You, you know, I mean, groomsmen and all that. No, keep the groom. You need that. Um, but, you know, there should be a master of the party. Someone that you go to. I guess it would be a coordinator, but master of the party sounds really good. Um, so he takes it to the master of the party, and, and, he, and he tastes it, right? And so something happens. This is what we're going to jump into text here. It says John 2, 8 through 10. Again, this is one of those moments. It's like, Jesus is like, are you here? Can you understand what's going on? Okay, so uh, in John 2, 8 through 10, it says, They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he came, he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first. And then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. You saved the best till now. That's usually how we approach things, right? We give the best first, and then once everybody is kind of numb, we give the rest of it, right? It's kind of like dating. You, you, You give the best first, right? And then you let them know you're crazy a little you know, <laughs> later on, you know, when they've gone kind of numb to you, <laughs> right? When they're used to you. That sounds bad. I'm sorry. But, it, but it's true. It's, that's how it goes. But what Christ is trying to show us through this, what this miracle that he made is that your most advantageous days are now. He doesn't give you just the best up front when you first find Christ and you decide to follow him. It's not just the best then. It just gets better. He saves the best for now. So this, another example in Scripture is the way that Jesus lived, the advantageous way of living. And one of the most striking qualities of Jesus, which was shocking, because, I mean, with anybody important, is that they don't give your, the full attention that they have. Jesus was always fully present, never halfway did it. He lived with an undivided attention in every moment. And so then we have back-to-back stories. So we, then we jump over to Luke's gospel. And as Jesus walked into Jericho, yes, the same Jericho, you know, walls, all that kind of, they, they rebuilt. Um, and, and so the, as he walked into Jericho, large car, uh, crowds began to surround him, right? And because he's got, he's on a mission. He's got things to do, right? Important guy. People want to hear from Jesus, and he walks through a crowd, and we hear this. This is one of the, some of the coolest things that happened were not scripted. It was not in the plan, our plan. It was in his plan. It wasn't in our plan, right? And so Jesus is walking through large crowds, and there was a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. And he screamed out, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. Have mercy. Screaming out in a crowd. You don't necessarily do that in that time because if, if you're begging for mercy, that meant you didn't have it together. And so for not only for him to be blind and to be already thought to have something wrong with him, he did something wrong that he deserved to be blind, not only that, but now he's screaming out in desperation, which probably would have been embarrassing to some. And it was embarrassing to the people that heard it so much so that the disciples rebuked him. They're like, Hush up! (laughs) Shut your mouth! Do you know who you're standing in the presence of and what we're doing? Hush! You're embarrassing yourself in your desperation. So they rebuked him, but then Jesus rebuked them. He looks at the guy and he says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And so for us, in our human way, um, we would use that as like, what do you want me to do for you? But no, Jesus was different. He slowed down and says, hey, what what do you want me to do for you? You got my attention. You're willing to embarrass yourself and, and to be rebuked to get my attention. What can I do for you? He just wants to be healed. He's like, okay, we'll stand up. And he's healed. Jesus stopped for the guy that no one had time for, and he did this a lot. Um, In Luke 19, 1 through 2, we we move on. This is the back-to-back part of it, right? Um, He goes on, and it says, Jesus entered in Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief 
tax collector and was wealthy. The term chief tax collector was not a good term in this time. <laughs> it was not a liked person, okay? Nowadays, you can work for the IRS and collect taxes and be respectable and, and, and a good person that just kind of helps follow the rules, right? And this time, that's not what they did. The government said, give me what I, what I am owed, and you can do what you want with the rest. And so they would skim off the top. They would, they would take from people. It, but Jesus was on his way to somewhere else. And now there's this chief tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus. Now he's going to interrupt. So they're already interrupted by a poor blind beggar, beggar. And then he stops for a rich, corrupt tax collector named Zacchaeus. Talk about two ends of the spectrum. I'm sure uh, head of security Peter was like, this is not a good situation. We can't stop. We got to keep moving. This is the, people are gathering. He's like, I will lop an ear off today, right? That's how he does. He, if you didn't know, spoiler, he cuts a guy's ear off for Jesus. Um, he just, something about ears, just not like them. Um, and then the tour manager, Matthew, who's trying to keep it on schedule because he's an ex, you know, I guess he was still t- collecting tax technically at the time, but he, he was like, he, I'm sure he was upset. because like, we're behind schedule, Jesus. Come on. We got things to do, Right? And then the pessimist and doubt coordinator, Thomas, he's like, I knew it. I knew this was going to happen, right? We were going to get off schedule and it's not going to work out, right? So there was frustrations, tensions were high. Think about you in that situation. If you have something to do and then you have all these people around you going, no, you shouldn't do that. No, you shouldn't talk to them. We got a schedule to keep, right? Don't disappoint us. I knew you were going to do this. Can you feel the pressure? It kind of feels like it's crushing in on you. But Jesus didn't care. He said, no, it's in my personality that I stop. That's what I do. I stop for people. Zacchaeus was so curious that he climbed to the top of a tree just to see Jesus. Because Jesus at this time was drawing big crowds. Right? And so he's, Zacchaeus is peering over. Um, so he was a tax collector, a, a corrupt IRS agent, skims off the top. And then Jesus, and you imagine how creepy this probably was for Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus climbs to the tree. He's heard of Jesus, but he has no idea if Jesus has heard of him. And can you, okay, so imagine you're Zacchaeus, you're in the tree, right? Big crowd, okay? Jesus walking through, and this is what happens. He looks at him and says, hey, Zacchaeus, come here. Think about that. If you were in that situation, had never met the person before, they look you dead in the eye, say your name, say, come here. And they're like, do you know something I don't? I, am I in trouble, right? Is this a trap? What, what is happening here? But that's how Jesus was. He goes in, you know, he says, hey, come on, we're going to go, we're going to go hang out. Come over for lunch, right? He invites Zacchaeus over. I would imagine at some point in the conversation, he's like, hey, how do, you, how do you know my name, right? How do, how do you know who I am? Am I wearing my name? Bed? I know I'm not wearing one. How did you know, right? There's this powerful moment. He says, come on over to lunch. And so he has this moment with, with Jesus, and, and he talks about how, you know, Zacchaeus kind of feels the pressure and the, and, the, and the guilt of all that he has done. And so he says half of his possessions, right? He's, he's like stole from, for, from poor people. And so he says, I'm going to pay it back now, because what Jesus tells him, he said, hey, make it right, right? So he says, I'm going to pay it back, and not just I'm going to pay it back, I'm going to give interest. Unheard of, right? They would have thought that Zacchaeus had drunk the wrong wine, right? It had gone, it had turned, right? It had gone bad. Now he's crazy, okay? This was very weird in this time. And so he goes on, and he says, I'm going to do this, and then he tells him, today, Because of your actions and your willingness to make it right, salvation is upon your house. And I'm I'm sure that was music to Zacchaeus' ears. Because he had been keeping this thing going because that's all he knew to do. And then he was in the moment, in a powerful moment, was given an opportunity of escape. Jesus was always present in the moment, and I want to be like that. I want to try to be like that. I'm not going to be Jesus. I know that. <laughs> I'm not perfect. I can never be perfect. Trust me, I've, I've, I haven't even tried because I know it's not possible, okay, because of how imperfect I am. But this is the advantageous way to live. 
not just living for happy moments, but fully present in all moments, even the annoying ones, even the ones that take you off track from your schedule of the day, all those moments. The possibility of stopping for someone that you don't even have to stop for, society would not blame you that you still stop for them and you give them a moment because you're here, right? You decide that I'm going to be here in all moments. I have, you know, two children and they're getting older, right? And they're still chaos, but it's not as chaotic, okay, as, as they were when they were little. And I can remember many times of either I was at home or Hannah was at home and, and then like you're out of the house and then you come back and it's just like you're right back into the chaos, you're tripping over toys, you're changing diapers, and you're sitting here thinking, man, wh- when can this be over, right? I want to get past this diaper stage because I want to worry about just my stuff, right, and not anybody else's stuff. And it gets really old, and you trip over toys. There's not enough batteries. You never have the right batteries for whatever toy that you have. And then you have to drive somewhere to go get batteries because Amazon can't deliver it quick enough for your kid. Um, uh, they need like 10-minute delivery because that's the tension that they want right now, right? And you have all these moments that frustrate you because it makes you feel inadequate because I don't have enough to offer. And then you walk in one day and there's no more chaos. The kids have gotten older. They know how to go to the bathroom <laughs> by themselves. I had a great, if you're a parent with a small kid, I have a great mentor of mine that always said, I don't know any 18-year-olds that are not potty trained to give you any solace, right? <laughs> eventually it'll happen. And it eventually happened for us. But now I walk into the house and it's really weird, but sometimes I miss the chaos. You know, the dependency that they had on me in that time felt like pressure, but sometimes I miss it. Sometimes I miss that the kids can't say the words right. (laughs) They say it in a weird way, in a cute way. And then one day they say it right, and you're like, oh, can you go back? I mean, I understand at school you got to say it the right way, but here at home, can you please, right? You end up missing. One day you'll miss it. Complaining today about the moments you'll miss tomorrow. About being in the moment. Are you still here? Are you still with me? Are you still paying attention? Statistical odds would say that you're not, and I've lost most most of you already. (laughs) A Harvard study said that 40% of the time, the mind is not where the feet are. 47% of the time. That's half the time. I know it's 3% (laughs) off, right? But this must be a person who has a great attention span, okay? But 47% of the time, that's the average, So chances are, if I preach a 30 to 40 minute sermon, uh, 15 to 20 minutes of that, you're not here. (laughs) You're here physically, but mentally you're not here. And that's okay, I get that. Like something triggered, something I said triggered something in your mind that made it something. But the mind usually goes to stupid things. The average cell phone user, and this is where most of our attention ends up today because of how powerful these little devices are. Here, catch this. The average cell phone user touches their phone 2,617 times a day. When I found that out, I started like, do I really do that? How many times? I was holding my phone at the time. I was like, oh, gosh, you know, <laughs> kind of a situation. Luckily, I had a, had a case on it. Um, didn't break. Otherwise, I buy another thing that I'm going to touch a bunch of times. Uh, extreme users. Extreme users. So that's the average, right? I don't know who they're basing this number off of because what age group it is. But the extreme users, I guess this would be teenagers or, or in your 20s. No offense to you guys. Top 10% of people, cell phone users, touch their phone more than 5,400 times a day. 5,400. Can you imagine that? And I'm, I'm trying to rack my brain. It's like, is that me? Do I do that? And I get it. I understand that your phone now is for business and you do all these things. I just had this conversation with my son uh, this week because he was talking about how he's moving on to middle school and he has a friend that he plays video games with, and he wants to stay connected. I'm like, well, get his email. Does he have iMessage? Blah, blah, blah. Anything I can do not to give him a cell phone number. And he's like, why can't I just have a number? And I was like, well, first off, money. 
It costs money to have a cell phone number. It's like, why does a number cost money? And I'm like, okay, it's bigger than that. There's service, and there's people out there, and they do all these things. They put these towers up. We've got to pay the people to put the towers up and run the service. And then it's a monopoly. And he's like, like the game? I said, kind of. <laughs> okay. <Whew. laughs> see, I, I feel pressure. See, I, <laughs> I feel chaos. Um, but it happens. And, and we're not wasting time on our phones. We're playing games in our head. Like what kind of games, okay? Uh, sometimes I do this. It's the if only game. You ever play the if only game in your head? If only, and this is when you were younger, if only I could get out of high school. If only I could, I could get out of college. If only I could get a job. And that turns into if only I could get a better job, right? If only I could get married. If only if I could have kids. Does this, any of this sound familiar? If only... I could get them out of diapers. If only I could get a better house. If only I could have a better vacation. If only I could not be so busy with kids. If only my kids could grow, get a little more grown. If only this many years could pass to get to whatever this thing is. If only. You play the if only game. You go through life wishing away the current situation because there's discomfort in what you have. And as you grow, you begin to learn this. You get wisdom that it's all uncomfortable for the most part. You just move on to a different uncomfortable situation. I thought I had it bad in college. Man, I wish I could go back to my problems in college. Not nowhere near the problems that I have now, but I thought then, if only if, only if I can move on. Don't miss what you have now pursuing what you want later. Don't miss what you have now trying to produce, uh, pursue what you want later. And if it's not the only, the if only game, it's the what if game, right? What if I don't pass the test? What if I don't get into the right school? What if I get a bad job? What if I don't measure up to what they want at my job? What if, uh, I'm, what if the economy doesn't turn the way that I think it should? What if I can't afford the house? What if I never find a, sp- find a spouse? What if? Right, you end up in these what if games in your head if you're not distracted by your phone. And there's a great scripture for this, Matthew 6, 34. Put, write this one down, put it on repeat in your head. Anytime something comes up, remember this scripture. Matthew 6, 34, it says, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Jesus didn't tell you not to plan for the future. He just said, don't worry about it. And he's telling you to don't worry about it because you have no control over it. You don't know truly what's going to happen tomorrow, or even if you have a tomorrow. It could all be over. Are you here? <laughs> Are you still with me? Why don't we like to live in the moment most of the time? Why are we always trying to escape the moment? And it usually has to do with a lack of faith. The only way you can be present in the moment is to surrender the past you can't change and trust God with the future you can't control. You surrender the past you can't change and you trust God with the future you can't control. That is what faith looks like. And somebody that's probably ever said that to you, it's like, oh, that was in the past. I'm not going to worry about the future. And they're like, oh, man, I wish I could just see pie in the sky like you, right? Well, I'm sure that they get hit with this stuff just like you. They can worry. Any human has the capability of worry because we're selfish and we think the world revolves around us most of the time. And then we worry about it because we're not in control of it all. Any, I mean, little pieces of it. We can move some pieces around, but ultimately, we didn't make this thing. We didn't start it spinning. We have no control over it, right? And so James 4, 13 through 14, it says, Look here, you who say, today or tomorrow we are going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do a business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like a morning fog. It is here a little while and then it's gone. It's like a fog. Your whole life is a vapor and it can be gone in a second. 
And he's trying to warn us of that. And we think about an hourglass, right? You ever use an hourglass? Not so much anymore, mostly for decoration. When you have an hourglass, you have no idea how many grains of sand are really in the top of it. It's too hard to figure out what that number is. But as it's falling, you have no idea how much is falling and how fast it is. It really depends on the hole and what you're trying to put through it, right? And then it, it piles down, right? And then it gets to the bottom. And the crazy thing about the bottom is you can't move it to the top because you do not have the power to turn it over. Only one does. Only one has the power to turn it back over and keep things going. You don't. And Psalm 118, 24 says, This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. He's trying to tell us, be thankful for what you have because you can't change it. Your time is now. And so he's saying, be here now. Don't worry about tomorrow. Plan, make plans all you want. That is fine. But don't worry about it because you can't control it. Are you still here? <laughs> Tell you what you, what, you, what you can't do. You can't be happy where you are not. You can't serve Jesus where you are not. You're, you can't love people where you are not. Some of the biggest moments in your life you can be fully present for, but the small moments matter most because overwhelmingly so, your life is filled with small moments more than the big ones. If you had to look at the percentages, there's way more small moments, overwhelmingly, shockingly, mundane moments overwhelm our life. And so it's what we do in those mundane moments that actually changes the trajectory of where we live and how we live and what we do. But we discount those things because it's not attention grabbing. We think nobody cares. Nobody wants to be a part of this, the small moments. Um, Hannah and I are big fans of this TV show, and so the next quote, I don't know, you could probably hate me for it or love me for it, I don't know, but it's in the last episode, and it gets us every time, right? So we've watched it through a couple of times. Every time it gets me. Uh, his name is Andy Bernard, right? <laughs> and if you already, you already probably already know what I'm saying, I'm about to say. It's in the last episode, and this is what he says. Man, it gets a tear, comes to my eye every time, right? It's, he says, I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. Because he was so hard to pursue. Don't miss what you have now pursuing what you want later. And to be fair, it is easy to get distracted, preoccupied with self. And you'd think that Jesus would have been consumed with himself because of what he had to do on the cross. But he was naked on the cross, beaten senseless, barely recognize, recognizable. And there was a man dying next to Jesus. And Jesus gives him, while on the cross, his undivided attention. I'd have been like, worry about yourself, bro. <laughs> Obviously, I got something going on. It does not concern you. But they had a conversation, and the man says he's sorry for what he's done. And he tells him, today, you'll be with me in paradise. He stopped for him. Jesus was and is fully present. You can't serve Jesus where you are not, and I mean mentally, not just physically, but mentally. You can't love people where you are not. You can't be happy where you are not. And it's hard to be great at something you are not there for. You can't be a great friend if you're not there for your friend. You can't be a great spouse if you're not there for your spouse. You can't be a great parent if you're not there for your kids. You can't be, keep a positive influence in people's life if you're not there. It takes being there in the moment. But the cool thing is, is this is the day that the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. Even though it might be mundane, this is your best moment now. You can have that if you have faith that he will do it. God saved the best for now. He didn't use the best early in your life. He has it right now for you. Right now, you have his mercy. You have his grace. You have his forgiveness. You have his freedom. You have his power. You have his purpose in this moment, in the seat that you're holding, that you're sitting in, in the cushion, 
on this planet, in this building, in this universe. Right now, you have access to all of this in this moment. God is with us. So your most advantageous days are now. Not next week, now. Not a month from now, now. Not when you get whatever you're trying to get to. If I just get to this point, no, now is your best days. But you have to be here. I'm not just meaning in church, which would be great. But you got to be in the moment. Your mind can't be anywhere else. you got to be present. Be physically here is not enough. You must mentally be present in every part of yourself. And if you do this, if you make 2023 the year that you were most present in every situation that you could, fully there, advantageous is inevitable. It's inevitable. If you can be fully there, just like Jesus was, all the, I know you're human, but every moment that you can, no matter how small, aggravating, annoying, great, whatever the moment is, if you can be there, you are destined for an advantageous way of life. So what are you going to do with it? Are you here? And if you're not here, do the exercise. Remind yourself where you stand in this universe and who's really in control. And that every step that you take, you are destined to take. It has purpose. That is an advantageous way to live. Let's pray. Jesus, you are so amazing. You had so much on your plate. You were still, you were God, but you were also operating under human circumstances. And, but regardless of that, regardless of the timeline, the pressure that you were holding, you loved us so much that you stopped for us. I might not have been Bartimaeus. I might not have been Zacchaeus. But Lord, I'm just as important to you as they were. You care about every soul, everybody that you've created. So Jesus, right now, I pray that we realize that. That we don't dismiss ourselves as insignificant because we're not in the chapters. We don't dismiss ourselves as, as not worth it because we're not a part of something that the culture deems as holy or whatever it may be. Lord, I thank you that regardless of what we have going on, you choose to love us fully. There's not a, just a portion of you. We didn't have to be born into the right family. We didn't have to make the right actions. You are fully available in this present moment right now. So every step that we take from here forward, this week I pray that it is heavy on our minds, that everything that we do was destined by our Lord and Savior, by our King, our God. So Lord, however that pans out for each of us, make that path clear. And how that pans out for Village Heights and everything that we do, make that path clear. Because that path takes us closer to you, and that is advantageous. Lord, we thank you. We worship you. In your name we pray. Amen.